So hello everyone and welcome to the Birthplace of Country Music Museum, both to our in-person audience and to our Zoomers who are looking at us from up there. Um, we are very glad to have you with us for our monthly speaker sessions. This is our second one of the year and we are very excited because it's both music and talking, both of, both of which we really enjoy. Um, a few housekeeping things before we move on to the main program. Um, if you're with us on Zoom, please stay muted and with your video off because that makes the experience better for everyone during the program. There will be an audience Q&A after the program. So if you have any questions, hold on to them and we'll have a chance to ask our guests about anything and everything afterwards. And if you are on Zoom and have a question, please put your question in the chat and we will call and we will include that in the Q&A part. One of the things that we'll do in the next couple of days after this program is we will send you a feedback survey. Please, if you have time, it takes less than five minutes. We would love to hear your thoughts on this program and to give us ideas for future programs. It always helps us to improve and provide new and wonderful things for the community. And then finally, the museum tries our best to provide free and low cost programming. So if you are so inclined, there is a small little donation jar over there. You're welcome to put anything you would like in it. Thank you. Before we move on, I want to introduce our guests tonight. You've heard them play, but now we will introduce them properly. First off, we have Greg Cornett. He is a fourth generation musician, born and raised in one of the most musically rich areas in our country, East Tennessee, which we are very fortunate mm -hmm. to live in. It is there that he heard his father and grandfather play the songs of the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers. And he carried on the legacy of other family members, like his great grandparents, who played fiddle and banjo. Greg's influences are woven into his guitar, mandolin, and banjo um, songs and repertoire to create his very own distinctive style. Tonight, he will be sharing those influences with us, especially timely with the Jimmy Rogers Martin guitar upstairs, the blue yodel guitar, which is on display for um temporarily here at the museum. So it's nice that we have that connection. And then of course we have Wayne Henderson. He is here from Rugby, Virginia, Southwest Virginia. Luthier, who specializes in the crafting of handmade custom acoustic guitars. He also occasionally makes other stringed instruments such as mandolins, banjos, and fiddles. Wayne's guitars are inspired by the great pre-World War II guitars of C.F. Martin and Company, again, like the Jimmy Rogers guitar upstairs, and are hand-built in limited quantities. Over, oh, as of the year 2022, Henderson has built nearly 900 acoustic guitars, over 100 mandolins, and has also built several banjos. He was ex originally exposed to the art of luthiery by the local by local Grayson County luthier Albert Hash, who was a violin builder and repairer, and that gave inspiration to Henderson and many other luthiers in our region. And in fact, if you come back to visit us in March when we have our new special exhibit, Women in Old Time Music, we will have a dulcimer made by Albert Hash's daughter, Audrey Hashham, on display as part of that exhibit. So all of the connections. So I'm going to hand it over to you guys. You don't need me here anymore. Um, and we will get some questions at the end. So start thinking about things you want to ask. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I brought some photographs with me, so let's see if we can get them rolling. I'm ready to study it. Scott is our helper. Oh, yeah, there we are. There's the reason we're here. A very much recognized photograph. That's Jimmy Rogers of Meridian, Mississippi. And I fell in love with his music for whatever reason, uh, for me, probably back in the 1970s. And dad always had uh, Carter family records and Jimmy Rogers records about. Um, I came to get into the 78s as I got later in life, but um, something appealed to me about Jimmy Rogers and his story. And we'll be going right over that story tonight. It, it's fascinating to me, and it gives me a reason to talk. And my daughter, somebody said, you sure like to talk. And I said, well, it's just that I'm so interested in the stories that I've heard. <laughs> and it, it's um, so, um, any, any, uh, any reason for an audience, I suppose. I want to thank my friend Wayne for driving down from Grayson County 
tonight. We had a, a nice dinner just down the street. We're going to, yeah, it was good. Yeah. It's Very a risk good. to eat or to eat and then play music. You know, because, you know, you have to use your voice and you have digestive things going on. So you have to have to be, you have to be smart. Before we do anything, I want to say I'm humbled and flattered by the folks who've decided to come up tonight. I have family and friends. Um, anything here that we talk about can be found elsewhere. But tonight, it'll be here. And it's uh, it's like other social events. It's a reason to get together and share the same space and uh, enjoy the passion that we have for uh, music, uh, the people that make music, and the tools that they use to make music with. It's all woven together. And there's the guy that that I kind of emulate and am influenced by. I'm not a Jimmy Rogers imitator, but I feel some of his passion down inside. So it's landed on me. And since that guitar is upstairs on the second floor, um, I thought it's a good reason to get everybody together. So thank you for coming. And we'll play some and we'll talk some. And if you get tired of one or the other, say something and we'll move from talking into playing or playing into talking. Big time in Georgia, apple picking time in Tennessee, cotton picking time in Mississippi. Everybody picks on me when it's roundup time in Texas. Cowboys make will be way on down in Alabama. Apple picking time for me. I need a lady, need a lady. You got the bluegrass down in Kentucky, Virginia's where they do the swing. Carolina, now I'm coming to spend the spring. Arkansas, I keep calling. Oh, I'll see you soon. That's when we'll do a little picnic. can't get by without uh, some little notes that I have. So I'll try to keep these pictures going and, and try to tell this story about uh, the man we know is Jimmy Rogers. That's his given name. And that's my granddaughter up there speaking to us. <laughs> and she's joining the show. So welcome to you all. Thanks for coming. As I said, it's, it's, uh, it's an honor to be able to do this, for people to be interested in things you have to say and the music that you play. Um, as I said, I'm not sure exactly where I got the Paris passion for Jimmy Rogers, other than being exposed to it at a very early age. And I've come to learn the story about Jimmy. He was born in 1897, back in uh, down in Meridian, 
Mississippi. He was one of uh, seven kids. His mother dies at, uh, when he was six years old, he was sent to live with other relatives in and around Meridian, Mississippi, different parts. He eventually ended up uh, living with his father, Aaron Rogers, and Aaron's new wife. Uh, Jimmy's father, Aaron, worked on the railroad in several capacities down in Mississippi. So when it came time for him to uh, be of working age, Jimmy um, started out as a water boy for the railroads. He eventually moved into actually being a brakeman. He adopted a nickname later in life called the Singing Brakeman. He worked on the same railroad line as his brother. He probably picked up tunes and songs. Um, large black population in Mississippi picked up songs uh, from that part of the country. And it, obviously it's, uh, nobody can be exactly sure after this much time where, where, those, where his style eventually came from, but regardless, he ended up with it. So tonight we can talk more about uh, that, that, what made him do what he did and where his passion for the music came from. Um, by 1918, he had uh, his first wife and a daughter. That marriage didn't. Uh, that marriage didn't work out. So keep that in mind for a little later. Uh, by 1920, he had married a lady called Carrie Williamson, and this is when Jimmy was 23 years old. He had a sis She had a sister named Elsie, Elsie McWilliams. Excuse me. And remember her. She'll pop up. Uh, She'll pop up in our story later as well. Uh, I do a lot of family history, and you're, uh, one thing about family history, public records have been digitized to a huge degree, and you can see death certificates uh, on people. And as you get into the time period that we're talking about right now, people died of infectious diseases, uh, influenza, pneumonia, polio, uh, diseases that you caught from each other. And now we die of things we do to ourselves. <laughs> Heart attack, stroke, cancer, that's one, two, three. So uh, in 1924, uh, Jimmy was diagnosed with tuberculosis at age 27. Um, <coughs> that's a lung disease. I'm a retired respiratory therapist. Uh, that disease is still around. Um, we as employees did not particularly like having to take care of patients with tuberculosis. It was rare in our field. We still see them. It's prevalent in the homeless population. And we gowned up and, you know, we wear all kinds of, uh, you know, moon, you, you think you're walking on the moon, the equipment that we have to wear when people are, are uh, afflicted with an infectious disease. So, in 1924, didn't know near as much about things as, as we do now. However, I feel that Jimmy Rogers knew he had tuberculosis and he knew what happened to people with tuberculosis. So you have to wonder if that affected his passion for expressing himself. He, uh, he worked on the railroad even after he developed TB. And you have to wonder um, how long he was able to do that. He wasn't able to do it very long. He left railroad work when he was still in his 20s. He played some music on the road and he was in his 20s, well before he ever came to Bristol. Um, went back to the railroad. Uh, he even ended up in Tucson, Arizona. And Tucson uh, is part of the country where uh, TB sufferers would gather. And si uh, uh, 
they could get some relief from TB. They weren't exactly sure why, but yet there was some relief from TB. Scientifically, in the years later, we have figured out that probably a lot of exposure to sunlight and UV actually would help with those infectious diseases. However, things didn't work out for him out in uh, Tucson, Arizona. So by 1927, ding, 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 big date, he was back in Meridian, Mississippi, trying to get uh, trying to get by as best he could. Let's go to C. And the songs that I'm doing aren't necessarily in the chronological order, but I think they kind of fit where I'm going to put them in there. So he, he wrote some songs, um, but songwriting I don't think was necessarily his strongest point. And I'll tell you in a minute where he came up with some other songs. While he was working on the railroad, here's... Uh, Here's, here's a song that might reflect the mood of how he was uh, feeling back then when he was trying to make a living and uh, trying to provide for his family. Tonight as I lay on my box car, just waiting for a train to pass by. What will become when a girl's tongue comes to death, there's a master of yonder in Got a place that we might call our home. Will we have to work for a living? Or can we continue to work? Will there be any freight trains in here? Any boxcars in which we might hide? Will there be any tough cops or brickmen? Will they tell us that we cannot ride? Will the whole boat chug with the rich? Will we always have money to spare? Will they have respect for the poor? And that land which lies hidden. Will there be any freight trains in here? Any box cars in which we might hide? Will there be any tough cops or brickmen? Will they tell us that we cannot ride? Will the hobo chum with the rich man? Here we always have money to spare. Build a respect for the people. That land which lies in the air. Little lady, little lady, little lady, little lady. Little lady. Now, you heard a little something there at the end that Jimmy Rogers became famous for. Not only was he such the nickname of um, the singing brakeman, he also ended up being called the blue yodeler. Now, I'm not a yodeler. I can kind of work it in there and make that happen. 
but there are people who have true yodeling voices. Jimmy Rogers was one of them. You ever hear Ranger Doug of the uh, Riders in the Sky? Now that's a yodel, but I just can't resist. So I, you know, right? I just can't resist. So I put it in there and do with it the best I can. So that, um, as I think back of, of what Jimmy was trying to do at the time, um, he is obviously he wasn't going to be able to do physical work for a living and provide for his family. He, uh, by spring of 1927, he ended up uh, just over the mountain over here in Asheville, North Carolina. And he was trying to make it as a performer. Oh, let's see if we can get this going right here. here. This will add to our story. Yeah. By 1927, that's a pretty good, this is thought to be from 1927. Uh, um, he is playing a Martin guitar um, well before he made it big. Um, and part of the reason that we're here is uh, Wayne has taught me almost everything that I know about Martin guitars. And to us, it's uh, us guitar nerds. That's our holy word. Um, so the CF Martin Guitar Company uh, existed and still exists in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Uh, Christian Frederick Martin uh, started building guitars as early as 1833, immigrated over to the United States, built guitars in New York, and eventually settled around uh, Nazareth, Pennsylvania. And there is a large um, uh, German population still to this day. That's their heritage around Nazareth. And I've done studies of the census, and it will tell where people are. Uh, from or where they were born. And at the time, in the 20s, there were plenty of uh, German immigrants living around Nazareth, Pennsylvania. And they worked in, uh, it's an industrial area as opposed to our area, which, is, which was primarily rural at the time. So they were able to make their living in that part of the country uh, working for factories. And there were many. And uh, the Martin Guitar Company was a guitar factory, um, very small potatoes compared to what else was going on uh, in that area. There was steel industry, um, cement industry was very prominent. Um, so these hand craftsmen were uh, employed at Martin and they made what everyone considered, and many of us still do, the finest stringed instruments in the world. Um, Wayne has purchased and found these as a hobby and you did it because you figured they were the best, right? Yeah, absolutely. You have several now. Yeah, I've got a, got a few. There's a few up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's like those car guys, they never can get enough. But there is, uh, there's, everyone has their passion for their interest. Part of uh, the interest that Wayne and I have are um, the musical instruments, which is obviously a physical being, but it's just sticks and wires. And, um, but it's something that a human, a person has crafted. And um, people like Jimmy Rogers would use this as a tool to express themselves and make his music and try to make a living. So how he came by a, a Martin guitar in 1927, this guitar is in the Hall of Fame down in uh, Nashville. He, it's hard to say, he, he must have wanted the best. And, and he, uh, as we'll talk about, he made money and he spent money. And he said, if, if, if you only have one dollar left to your name and that dollar would buy a steak dinner, buy yourself that steak dinner. And I think he lived like that. So 
here he is with a very expensive guitar. By uh, 1927, he was playing music uh, with, uh, with some fellows here from Bristol, actually, and they called themselves the Teneva Ramblers, Tennessee, Virginia. So they were from Bristol, and they were playing in Asheville. They were actually playing on the radio station WWNC, which is right down there at Pack Square in Asheville. Um, uh, coincidentally, and maybe for the same reason, Jimmy ended up in Asheville because TB sufferers also uh, tended to gravitate towards the mountains, the clean air. So it was kind of a desperate attempt among people who were very, very sick to try to find some relief. And um, miserable disease. You, you know, like I say, anything that I talk about can be found elsewhere, but um, he lived with a miserable disease and he was just trying to make a living and provide for his family. Um, in April of 1927, uh, Jimmy Rogers actually played for a Rotary Club convention over here in Johnson City. But at the time, he and I think his wife, Carrie, and a child were based over in Asheville. Somehow, nobody's exactly sure still, this group of musicians got word that RCA Victor was seeking new talent. And there's another term to remember too as we go along, new talent. So Ralph Peer, who was uh, a big player with RCA Victor, um, he was able to record and promote a lot of ethnic music, even as far as uh, South America. So these record companies figured out quickly that they needed new talent. So they would scout all over the country looking for that. So before 1927, there had been some country music recordings made. Um, no, one, no one can dispute that. The Stoneman family uh, recorded, uh, uh, musicians from Grayson County recorded before 1927. So Ralph Pierce said, let's go down to Bristol, take our recording equipment down there and see what we can find. So that's what they did. And they uh, publicized it as much as they could. So now imagine in a T-model Ford coming from Asheville, North Carolina to get to here. And also coincidentally from Hilton's Virginia to get to here. And if you read the, fa the story of the Carter family, it was a major endeavor to get from Hilton's Virginia to here. It ended up being a, a two patched tires. And you know the Carter family is a whole story on their own, but the point was they wanted to be here. They figured they had something to offer. And as far as uh, the Carter family was concerned, they lived on the farm. And Cash money was hard to come by. Please come in. Please come in. It doesn't bother us a bit. And we're having a good time. And we've not done much so far. So the Carter family lived a rural subsistence. They were just trying to feed their families. So they made their way to Bristol. Many, many, many people made, to, made their way to Bristol and recorded here in the summer of uh, 1927. And on August 4th, uh, 1927, uh, Jimmy Rogers was recorded within rock throwing distance to hear. Just fascinating. We're breathing that same air, I think. Some of those air molecules have still got, still got to be here. So, Ralph Peer did set up a studio on the second floor of a hat, hat company over here uh, on State Street. They put the word out. They hung uh, uh, blankets up in the room and um, recorded many, many people. Now, why some of them were inspirational to people that bought records? I don't know. That's the magic potion that performers 
and songwriters are still trying to figure out to this day. It's a mystery. Um, Jimmy did not sing an original tune. This is an E. He did not sing, he had, he ended up singing by himself. There was some disagreement with the rest of his band members. So I just think he said, I'm going to go do it on myself. Then you guys do what you want. I'm going to go. So here he went and he ended up doing a couple of songs that were not brand new. They were known for the day. Um, nothing snappy. Um, Think about at this time who the contemporaries in music were. You know, that was Tin Pan Alley, ragtime music, Pippi. Um, this was not, this was something different. Um, I don't normally perform this song, but um, I just thought I'd give it just a little try. This is one of the two songs um, that Jimmy performed on that day. He did a song called Soldier Sweetheart. And then another one called Sleep, Baby Sleep. And I'll do just, just a little bit of it. Sleep, baby, sleep, dear. Close your bright eyes. Listen to your mother. Sing his love. Listen to your mother while she sings to you. Why did he like to do that? I don't know. But if you listen, and the music is easily accessible, you can find it on YouTube and listen to it for hours. But if you listen to him, it comes out of him just like uh, leaves falling off a tree. It's beautiful. It's gentle. And if you happen to listen to that song right there, the actual recording that they made over here in that empty room was the same one that was issued on that 78. And I'm going to push this button here and see what pops up. There we go. It's that one right there. If you listen to that song, you can hear the echoes in that room, um, which to me is just haunting because there it is. And that, song for Jimmy took off for him. It had some modest success. Um, but Ralph Peer was a businessman and he knew where the money was. The money was in original songs. Son, you come up with some original songs for us and we will record for you. We will give you as much as a penny per record sold. Now, isn't that cool? You know, so um, Carter family, of course, faced the same uh, presentation to them. Come back with original songs. Jimmy was not a natural songwriter. But if you will remember, his wife had a sister named Elsie, Elsie McWilliams. She had a talent for songwriting. 
So Jimmy would um, try to, uh, to uh, interact with her as much as he could. And she has plenty of songwriting credits throughout his whole career. But keep an eye on things. Oh. Remember how I love to hear myself talk? <laughs> <laughs> how long are we supposed to go? I don't know, but if you get sick and tired, you all can leave. But an hour or so, right? So I will, uh, there, there's two stories we need to tell, to tell tonight. So I will do this story. So you can tell I have a passion for this music and this man. As I said, I don't know how it came. I don't know why it appealed to me that much. Um, in 1928, um, in January of 28, Ralph Peer formed Southern Music Publishing Company, and he strove to have as many copyrights on songs as he could, and it brought in money. It brought in big money. Um, if you compared it to what uh, Jimmy Rogers took in and what uh, the Carter family took in, it was very big. However, if you didn't have any money coming in, um, you were glad to have it. And my dad always said, there was only one man that had it worse um, than the man in the coal mine with the job in the coal mine. The only man who had it worse was the man who didn't have a job in the coal mine. Now, that's a, think about that. My grandfather grew up mining coal and that was cash money no matter how little it was. Um, in November of 27, um, they, Jimmy actually went up to Camden, New Jersey and recorded uh, his first full-time, full-fledged session at Camden at the RCA studios. Uh, Enrico Caruso recorded there. Um, so those are the types of contemporaries of the day. That was the mecca that they went to. That was when he recorded, um, let's see if I have this right. Yeah, you do. Come on. Be, be, be. All right. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Oh, my battery hasn't died. Ah, that was back. Let's go forward. Technology, right? He, he was able to um, record T for Texas, T for Tennessee. That was his boom, big hit. This occurred um, by the time 1928 rolled around, his life had completely changed. He decided uh, that's when he wanted the best of the best. And this guitar upstairs is the, at the day was the best of the best. That CF Martin company that we talked about they were a wholesaler. They sold to music stores. They didn't sell to individuals. For some reason, they took the order from Jimmy Rogers to build this guitar for him and even sold it to him as a at a discount. They didn't endorse performing artists, but something must have appealed to them enough that they decided to do this for him. Um, they, it takes, it, it took Martin guitars months to be completed in the factory because they built hundreds and hundreds. They finished this in a month. They had other people doing the special pearl work, but it was ordered in June of 28. It received in July of 28. That's the guitar that's upstairs. That note is an actual note from C.F. Martin III, a direct descendant. Um, so if you ever see that upstairs, you can see the, you can see the writing. That's it, that's him. And I can't remember my slides, so I'm just gonna keep moving. That's inlaid in the headstock. He called himself the blue yodeler, but apparently, they thought Yodeler was going to be a little too crowded to get on that part of the guitar. So it's called the Blue Yoda. So by, uh, by 1929, he was fully performing, making a, making a living playing music. 
this dude in the jailhouse now. In the jailhouse now. That's my granddaughter. Yeah, That's watched. right. On yeah. Zoom, Wayne's granddaughter is watching. Hopefully, she's not gone to bed. But this she is her. Have, but I don't know. This is her favorite tune. <laughs> I had a friend named Rambling Bob. He used to steal gambling rocks. Thought he was the sweetest guy in town. I found out last Monday. I've got locked up Sunday. Got him in the jailhouse way downtown. He's in the jailhouse now. He's in the jailhouse now. I told him once or twice. Quit playing cards and shooting dice. He's in the jailhouse now. He played a game called poker. He up with Dan Yoker. Shooting dice was his greatest fame. He's downtown in jail. Nobody to go his bail. Judge said he will have to pay that fine. He's in the jailhouse now. He's in the jailhouse now. I told him twice. Quit playing cards and shooting dice. He's in the jailhouse now. That's for Matilda. That's for granddaughter Matilda. And maybe it'll be my maybe it'll be my granddaughter uh, Avery's favorite song too. So that uh, in 1929, Jimmy was down in uh, the, the heart of Mississippi playing shows, health failing all the time. Um had a show booked. Uh, Jimmy traveled a lot with these traveling shows. They put up big circus tents, and he was part of a traveling troupe. So here is a newspaper advertisement from Gulfport, Mississippi, 1929. Uh, you know, come and see Jimmy Rogers. So one evening, he was uh, with the crowd assembled. He was unable to perform. So the uh, the MC came out and said, we're looking for a young man that apparently lives in this area named Bill Bruner. Would someone go find Bill Bruner? Well, who in the devil is that? He was a teenage boy who sang Jimmy Rogers tunes. So he was it's like the Beatles not being able to play. Go find a band that plays like the Beatles. Well, everybody's doing the Beatles. So Bill Bruner was a young boy that was able to sing Jimmy Rogers tunes. So he came in, did the show, and with much appreciation from Jimmy Rogers himself, he, Jimmy presented another guitar to him, a guitar that he was using at the time. Not the guitar that's upstairs, the other guitar, but this guitar that's upstairs. This is a, a cheaper grade model guitar that was made in New Jersey. Uh, Jimmy had it at the time and presented this guitar to young Bill Bruner with my blessings, son. And he even signed it. He, sincerely, Jimmy Rogers, 4829. That very instrument is upstairs. It's a cool story about it that we'll get to in just a second. But Bill figured he would carry on the torch. And he actually recorded a couple of 78s, one of them being he's in the jailhouse now. 19, uh, so he keeps that guitar, moves on his way in his upcoming musical career. Um, by October of 1929, a big date in American history. That was the crash of the U.S. stock market. And from what I've read, record sales in any one year around that time was around 100 million records. And those are primarily 78s, which are just a couple of songs. If you want a lot of songs, you got to buy a lot of records. So 
they could sell 100 million records from all sources in one year. Uh, by 1931, nationally, it had fallen to 10 million. So the record sales had dropped to 10% of what they had been. So clearly things were coming to a, to a change in the, in the country. Jimmy, however, was still doing as well as he could. Um, he built um, a mansion in Kerrville, Texas called Blue Yodeler's Paradise. And I've been there, a beautiful part of the hill country of Texas, beautiful brick home, not a mansion by our standards, three or 4,000 square feet, wonderful family still lives there. And I got to walk through there for just a little bit several years ago. And there again, I felt honored to be up there. By the late part of uh, December of 1929, Apparently, Jimmy's record sales were still doing very well. He was invited up to um, Camden, New Jersey, to actually make a short film. They were nicknamed Shorts. And those shorts played before major, uh, um, major movies. So if you look up the short industry, Hundreds of thousands of those were made. Jimmy ran up there and sang three songs, I believe. It's about a 10-minute film, and it was distributed across the country and played before um, other, other, other movies. And it's a, it's a bit embarrassing to hear what Jimmy Rogers sounds like compared to what I can do. But he had that wonderful, nice Martin guitar with him that he never parted with and had it up there in New Jersey in 1920. I got some coffee around here. I got some coffee around here. <laughs> that was on a sound stage in uh, Camden, New Jersey. They did uh, a couple of takes. That's the one that came out the best. Uh, one reviewer said, I had seen Jimmy Rogers a couple of years ago, and now he looks a little more gaunt to me. So even the, rev even the reviewer was picking up on, on the changes that Jimmy, um, uh, that was occurring to him, uh, that was happening to him. By 1931, um, he was still making a good living. That first daughter and the ex-wife reappear and uh, file a lawsuit against him, looking for uh, some of that revenue. They had apparently been left behind. So there's that. Wife and daughter, I told you, it would pop back up. Um, 1932, um, he's still making a living at it. His health worsens, and the Great Depression deepens. Um, from, from what I have studied and read about Jimmy Rogers, he, he had a, a, a passion for the music that I I think he felt no other way to be able to get by. He always struggled to find new songs to record because that's what the, the, that's what the recording company wanted. Um, you can listen to a box set of Jimmy Rogers, and there is a series of songs called The Blue Yodels, Blue Yodel number eight, Blue Yodel number nine the basic format, all being very, very similar. So I think by the time uh, the beginning of 1933 rolls around, he, uh, I don't know if there was desperation, but for some reason he headed to uh, New York City unsolicited. And by this time, Ralph Peer, because of some business dealings, didn't have near as much pull 
with RCA Victor that he did before. But um, Jimmy breezed into town uh, riding a high horse, uh, checked into the finest hotel he could find and said, Bill, that to RCA Victor, they're expecting me. <laughs> so he, he did make contact with Ralph Peer, who apparently was a bit surprised that he did show up. And so, you know, he said, Mr. You know, Mr. Peer, I want to record some songs. I'm ready. You told me to come when I was ready and I'm ready. <clears throat> so this was, uh, this was in 1933. Jimmy's health was uh, at the worst it had been. Uh, he was up in New York City by himself. Uh, Peer did arrange a recording session for him that would last for, for a few days. Peer himself didn't come, but he sent an underling producer to come to these recording sessions. And by that time, Jimmy was in such ill health. Uh, apparently, the story is true that he would um, um, record some and lie down some. And they those, those recordings, there were five or six actually issued, and you can listen to them. And they're even at the very, very last. He is still giving it his best and doing what he can. And you can just hear that weakness in his voice. But he did absolutely the best he could because I think he, he wanted to make a living and be an entertainer and provide for his family. Um, by, the end of, uh, by the end of May, he was, he was done for. He was in a hotel room uh, in Manhattan, New York, uh, by himself. And the effects of tuberculosis uh, got to him. And he died in a hotel room with uh, an assistant from RCA Victor that uh, nobody even remembers her name. So that was a sad ending. In five, that was a five and a half year career. And he made 110 recordings in that time. Um, back then, prior to, prior to records, if you wanted to be famous, you had to move throughout the whole United States to make yourself famous. By the time recordings came around, you just had to sing that song one time. And we'll send it all over the country for you. So Jimmy Rogers was among the first batch of entertainers to gain popularity through record sales. And you can look up uh, what his contemporaries were at the time. Even uh, Guy Lombardo was recording at that time. That's who was also selling records. But if you go through antique shops right now and look through 78s, if you find a Guy Lombardo record, it looks almost brand new. If you find a Jimmy Rogers record, you can put your finger through the hole. It's so worn out. It has been played and played and played. Same with Carter Famer records, same with uh, Skilt Lickers, any of the old timers. That's the kind of music they like. Oh, bless your heart. That's all right. That's the, <laughs> hey, that's the sounds of life, right? That's, <laughs> that's hope for the future. Um, after Jimmy died, it was not long before imitators started popping up. Uh, Gene Autry uh, and Ernest Tubb. They were in their uh, late, you know, in their 30s, 40 years old around that time. If you listen to their very early recordings, they are stone cold trying to do Jimmy Rogers. And uh, by 1936, Ernest Tubb contacts Jimmy's widow, Carrie, and asks her for uh, an autographed photograph if, he, if she has any left over. Well, they ended up getting in touch and corresponding, and Carrie's so impressed that she gives him some of his old clothing. She gives him Jimmy Rogers' derby hat, and she gives him that very guitar that is upstairs, the fancy Martin guitar. And I was such a Martin guitar fan that in 1982, I asked Wayne to build me one just like it. And that's this one right here. 
And I, it, uh, I ordered it one certain way. There's pearl all over this thing, which is more work, right? And I ordered it with pearl on this top. And I was bugging Wayne. I said, is it done? Is it done? Is it done? Is it done? And so he finally called me. He said, well, you know, I could go ahead and make that just like Jimmy Rogers if you want to with all that pearl. I said, I'll do it. <laughs> so said so this, uh, we're getting deep into trivia now. There's a little piece of wood on top of this right here that a friend of mine was in the Bahamas. He was walking down a boat dock and there was a pile of wood stacked up there and he recognized it as the same kind of wood that Wayne uses to build these guitars out of. My friend was Bugs. Bugs said to these guys, could I have some of that wood? He, was, he had flown down there and they said, well, sure. And uh, they told him that this was Truman Capote's yacht that they were remodeling. <laughs> And they were tearing out the cabinets and dining room tables and throwing all that wood out on the dock. And he brought a big chunk of that wood that would fit in an overhead compartment and brought it to Wayne. What did you do with some of those smaller pieces? Well, I made uh, all kinds of, there was enough of it to build a couple of sets of sides and backs for a guitar. There's one of them, somebody told me last week is for sale right now. That no. I'm to belonged to Alice Gerard that I built in the, in the 80s sometime and is made the back and I made several headstocks like this. Yeah. It don't take such a big piece of wood. It's just a little slice like a veneer that goes yeah. on right there. And, and I got to make, you know, several small body guitar backs out of it. And then I, then I dig you out the knife handle. Yes. And I have a knife handle on one. I, I now still, whether... I still I found a piece big enough to yeah. So whether the, any association with Truman Capote makes it more expensive or well, less expensive, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't had, know. Had the same thing. People say, "Well, I don't know about that fellow." <laughs> <He, you know, laughs> I, I didn't know anything about him, but I'd heard of him, you know. <laughs> and uh, it'd have been Jimmy Rogers. It'd have been uh, a, yeah, it might have made more famous piece of wood, you know. <laughs> but. Uh, Anyway, that is Brazilian rosewood, the very same, very same thing the old Martin up there is made out of. And, and uh, is you know, beautiful wood and just uh, has a sort of an exciting story. It does have an exciting story. Yeah. There's a, when uh, Jimmy uh, Rogers met the Carter family up in Louisville, Kentucky, while they were up there at the same time, uh, as I said, Jimmy May, money and he spent money that's a brand new packard from kerrville motor company there in kerrville texas um as i said the um the imitator started popping up that's ernest tubb with that martin guitar that's upstairs right now after uh jimmy rogers widow carrie gave it to him he started uh performing with that ended up being uh, the biggest of the big back in the 1950s. By 1953, the town of Meridian decided they wanted to do a Jimmy Rogers Memorial Festival. So uh, the Grand Ole Opry and their performers were heavily involved in helping to organize that show. So there was uh, Hank Snow, Grant Turner, the announcer, Minnie Pearl, Little Jimmy Dickens, uh, Carl Smith, Carrie Rogers was there, his widow. Um, Elsie McWilliams, the songwriter, and the sister was there. The governors of Tennessee and Mississippi were there. And this little trio right here, that's the last time the original Carter family ever performed together on stage. And if you want to get on YouTube and look it up, the last performance, uh, they had been uh, not together for many, many years. But you can listen to that recording. A.P. Carter introduces Anchored in Love and God Gave Noah the Rainbow Sun. And that was just like hearing ghosts to me. So that uh, one other person that showed up, 
One other person that showed up was our buddy, Bill Bruner, that Jimmy had given him that guitar back in 1928. He was blue collar. If he were ever going to make it in the music business, he would have made it by now. This was, he was in his forties. Um, so he was providing for his family. The, the, the idea was that Bill over here would present this wonderful guitar that had been owned by Jimmy Rogers to this fellow, Jimmy Rogers Snow, the son of Hank Snow, who was as huge in the industry at that time as anybody. So the idea was uh, Jimmy Rogers Snow was going to be carrying on the legacy of Jimmy Rogers. So major ceremony, Bill presents this guitar to young Jimmy Snow with full blessings. Well, Jimmy never got into the music business. He got into the preaching business. And if you want to look it up, there is a famous, he was filmed in 1957 giving a sermon from his pulpit on the dangers to the youth of rock and roll music. <laughs> Fervent. Uh, so, so let's say that took care of his, that took care of his musical career, right? So in, uh, there's Jimmy, there's Hank. That's that very guitar upstairs. How physical, pieces of stuff like this make it to the point where they are in life today. It's a mystery. That guitar has passed through hands. The fancy guitar has passed through hands, but yet here it is. So maybe some of their uh, DNA is still up there. Ernest Tubb kept uh, Jimmy Rogers' fancy guitar way up through his career until it eventually ended up back at uh, Jimmy Rogers' family, and family has graciously loaned it up here. Uh, in that short film clip that we saw, the thanks was not painted on the back of that guitar yet. I've looked at it real close. So that's, that's a sign painter. It's in the style of uh, people that painted windows and uh, office doors. So, so there's the... There's the guitar that's up there. Um, Jimmy Rogers Snow in later years decided to consign that guitar, sell it, and use the money for his ministry. That's where I came in. I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was not playable. Uh, Hank Snow loved that guitar so much, he drilled a hole right through the sound hole and hung it up in his den. So if you look, there's a hole right through the other side. So Wayne got that into working condition for me. I played a few songs on it, and it has uh, changed hands a couple of times, at, uh, and it is now on to the museum up here. Um, <clears throat> that's the circuitous route, routes that these two instruments have taken to get into this spot, into our world and into our universe at this time. As I said, it's, it's just wood and wire, but um, I like the sound that this makes. It makes me think of Jimmy Rogers when I play it. Um, most of all, I love it because my good friend made it. <laughs> And we make music with it. Let's do some. Okay. How long are we supposed to? Uh, we're about, yeah, we're about. Yeah. <laughs> the, the meat of it is gone. The meat is off the bone. We're done. Right? So now we just play. Right. When a woman gets the blues, she ain't your little head in the When a woman gets the blues, she ain't your little head in the but when a man gets blue, grabs him a train. Look, he 
run coming down the railroad track. Look beyond the earth coming down the railroad track. See the black smoke rolling, rolling from that old smoke. Don't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad it works. And I, <laughs> um, who has questions? If there's a question to be asked, uh, we'll, we will do our best. If you have a question, I'll bring this to you. We've already had one question and someone asking if their guitar was done yet. And I don't even, I don't even have to check, tell them that the answer is no. <laughs> Wayne, uh, uh, please welcome my good friend, Wayne. Very glad to be here and appreciate you calling and telling me about this. It was good. I had a, I had a good time picking a, Few licks along. I had a good supper too. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you for a very good presentation. Check there one more time, Scott. Yeah, the oh, there it went. I heard it. I heard that tap. Okay. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Yes, My question is Did Jimmy Rogers leave any money for his family? The question was, did Jimmy Rogers leave any money for his family? Um, I'm not dug too deep into that, but um, probably not. Uh, I would, I think he was up in New York City for a reason, just wanting to continue his career. So I would say, I would say very little. I'd say very little. Um, plenty of family members still around. Uh, they have participated in events here at uh, at this facility, and they still um, many many live in um, the Meridian area. I do family history, and um, I don't think there are any re very many Rogers millionaires <laughs> down there. Yes, sir. I, I, I just like to say I think that they probably did leave some money because there, there's all his royalties from his music. Where else would they have gone? I mean. The Gershwin family is still making money, and he, he died in the 1930s. That's so. true. I would. Uh, and she could afford to give away a D20, D40, D28. That uh, there was probably the, the issue of royalties was, as just mentioned, and I'd say that's right. 
But I would say, and I've got a friend, Tim, could probably help me with this. Modest amount. Back then, a penny a, penny a record. Yeah, I, I wish I was making a penny and spend for my songs on Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> on Spotify, that you get a penny for about a thousand, every thousand plays, right? I, I think it was able to provide something. You make a very good point. But haven't those just run out within the last 10 years or so? Was it 75 years? Yeah, copyright. Copyright lasted for 75 years. And uh, um, some of the songs that he would have written would be in the public domain. They're in the public domain now. And Jimmy was maybe like some of the, the other musicians. My papa said they just weren't very work brickle. <laughs> Twenty-six or so, right now. Yeah, yeah. The 1927 recordings aren't in the public domain yet. Getting that. They'll be there in about a year or so. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So, uh, sticking with the money thing, you <laughs> talked about uh, beer made a lot of money, and Rogers and, and the Carter family made a little money. Somewhat less. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any? Rough idea of like how much beer made and how much Jimmy and uh, and uh, Carter family made. I'm not sure what that percentage would be. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, it's in that it, it is it's detailed in that book. I can't okay. pull it up, but I would Carter's weren't uh, Carter's and Jimmy weren't living up in New York City. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, and also think about peer is making money on the copyright for the song, if it hasn't been assigned copyright already, the, the performance, the recording, yeah. and also then taking management fees probably for some of the artists. And then went into all those other types of genres. So. It was a sweet deal yeah. for those guys. It's a sweet deal. So. Anyone else? You had mentioned the um, question of how Jimmy Rogers and the Teneva Ramblers knew about the sessions. Have you ever heard that it was through Jack Pierce and Jack Pierce's mother who was running the boarding house here where they stayed when uh, that she had informed them? That of it? does ring a bell. Okay. I'm a, I'm a more of a Jimmy Rogers aficionado than a scholar. <laughs> so my, my, uh, I, I, I get the main points, but that, Sounds valid to me. Beer, beer ran the ads in the paper. So, I mean, and, and he, he put in the ad that uh, Pop Stubman made like $1,700 for one recording. Yeah. So $175 or whatever. It was a lot of money back then. And when people saw that in the paper, that is what, like, cha-ching, let's go to Bristol. Cash money. That, that, that was uh, that, that that article or that ad in the paper. Everybody read the paper. Nobody had a phone or the internet, so the paper was the news. So that right. that ad that ad did bring a lot of folks around. And, then, and the other rumor, or that, what I've always heard, was that the Neva Ramblers had gone to Johnson City to look for a car, and they found out about the Bristol recordings going to happen in August. So they just hiked it all up to Bristol to check it out because they were musicians. <laughs> There's, there are uh, recordings of transcripts of the interviews of Richard Russell with those brothers. Uh, it clogged me, especially. Mm -hmm. He tells the whole story from his perspective. Man. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a big bang. And he ended up being the father of, father of country music, right? Let's see. We got him up there. Where you at, Doug? So, Scotty, do we have any um, questions in the Zoom chat? That ain't being. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do. Uh, how about if we do a couple more for you before we go? Yeah. All right. Yeah. This is one he sang in the uh, in the film. And it's all the round. What a thing waiting for a train Thousand miles away from home Sleeping in the rain I walked up to a brakeman He 
to give him a lot of talk. He said, if you got money, but I'll see that you don't walk. Well, I haven't got a nickel, not a penny, and I sure get all get out. Railroad bum and slam that box from old. Get a lady, get a lady, get a lady. Well, this has been a really amazing evening. So thank you to you both. Thank you to Greg and to, to Wayne for being here with us, for sharing such a great program and so much wonderful music. Thank And thank you also for thank you also for being here with us as an audience. You've made the night extra special, both the Zoom and the in-person. 
Um, before you go, I just want to tell you a few other things about the museum that are coming up that you might be interested in if you've enjoyed tonight's program. Um, our next speaker sessions is going to be held as a virtual only event via Zoom on Tuesday, March 14th, 7 p.m. with Jen Larson, Archives Manager at the Grand Ole Opry. She'll be giving us a behind the scenes perspective on the many wonderful artifacts and collections in their care. So that should be really interesting. Thursday, February 23rd, so just later this week, we have our Radio Bristol Book Club. We'll be on air at 12 noon talking about Never Seen the Moon, The Trials of Edith Maxwell by Sharon Hatfield. We'll also be talking with the author. If you like true crime, that is a true crime um, that happened just around Pound, Virginia, and was a huge sensation across the nation, apparently. I'd never heard of it. It's fascinating. Um, Saturday, February 25th, from 2 to 5 p.m., we have our monthly Bluegrass Jam with hosts East Tennessee Bluegrass Association here at the museum. And Friday, March 3rd, at 10.30 a.m., we have one of our new programs for toddlers and their grown-ups. Our museum story time will be reading Cowboy Dreams, listening to a song by Mama Molasses, and just having a good time with little teeny, teeny tots. Um, you mentioned Elsie McWilliams several times. Yeah. We feature her in the Women in Old Time exhibit that is coming up on March 23rd. So do come and check her out. You also mentioned Alice Gerard. She's also featured. So you gave a lot, you did a lot of pre-advertising for us. So yeah, please come down, say hi, but thank you guys for being here tonight.